My name is Michael Young. I'm an insurance coverage and extra contractual lawyer in St. Louis, Missouri, and this is another tale from Insurance Land. On January 23, 1920, Mamie Bichon had just finished her work for the day at Cockrell's Drug Store. The store was located on the corner of Main Street and Congress Avenue in Houston, Texas. She lived in the southern part of the city. It was late at night, after 8 o'clock, maybe even 8.30. She must have been tired, and it was raining, so she decided to take a taxi ride back to her home. Her taxi driver, who was operating a Ford sedan, drove away from the drugstore and turned south onto Austin Street. What they did not know was that sometime earlier that evening, Otis Perry, a 20-year-old driver for G.A. Stowers Furniture Company, had crashed his furniture delivery truck into a wooden wagon that someone had left unattended on the side of Austin Street. The force of that collision had damaged his furniture truck very badly. It disabled the motor so the engine could not run, and the fender was bent down over the tire so that it was impossible for Otis Perry to move the truck out of the roadway. He went to the nearest telephone to call for help. And did I mention that the truck's collision with the wagon caused the truck's taillights not to work? You know what happens next. As Mamie Bashan's taxi roared down Austin Street at 20 to 30 miles per hour, it slammed into the back of the Stowers furniture truck. Ms. Bashan was thrown from the taxi and landed under the furniture truck. She was unconscious for about 45 minutes. In her lawsuit against Stowers Furniture Company, she later reported significant injuries from the accident. I suffered a bad wound which cut and lacerated my throat, injuring the thyroid glands. Some sharp instrument cut or penetrated my throat to a depth of nearly an inch, cutting some arteries, which caused me a great loss of blood. I was informed by my physician that the force with which I was thrown from the automobile was such that it inflicted either a strain or rupture on one of the valves of my heart, and the injury is very dangerous, as it's liable to prove fatal at nearly any time. I fear the same is incurable. She asked for damages in the sum of $20,000 for her injuries, $174 for her doctor's bills, and $33, which she said was the value of her clothing. Altogether, that is about $306,000 in today's money. Stowers Furniture Company had an automobile liability insurance policy with American Indemnity Company. The policy had a limit of $5,000. In today's money, that's about $78,500. Ms. Bashan eventually made a demand to settle her claim against Stowers for the $5,000 policy limit. So, we had a plaintiff making a claim that she said was worth more than $20,000, and we had it insured with a policy limit of only $5,000. Surely, this would be a claim for the insurance company to settle, right? The key issue in Ms. Bichon's lawsuit against Stowers Furniture Company was how long the delivery truck had been left unattended in the middle of Austin Street at night with no lights on. The longer the Stowers truck was left unattended by its driver, the more likely Stowers was negligent. The insurance company felt the evidence showed that the truck was left unattended for only about 10, 15, or maybe even 20 minutes before the accident. Here is what the Stowers driver, Otis Perry, had to say at trial. After my truck collided with the wagon, I got out of the truck and looked around. I saw that the motor on the truck was so disabled that the truck could not be moved and its lights could not be made to burn. I left the truck and went to a drugstore two or three blocks away to telephone for assistance. I was only gone for 10 or 15 minutes before Ms. Bichon's accident. In an era long before cell phones, being away for only 10 or 15 minutes maybe did not seem that unreasonable. At first, the insured Stowers Furniture Company agreed with its insurance company's evaluation of the claim. Here's I.P. Walker, the manager of the Stowers Furniture Store in Houston. 
The night of this accident, the police were called to the scene, and they immediately exonerated our driver, stating that he was not to blame under the circumstances, and if there is really anybody who is to blame, it should be the man who left his wagon in the street without a light of any kind. But then we have the issue of race. You see, the point of Mamie Bashan was white. The pleadings repeatedly referred to her as a, quote, respectable white business lady. The Stowers furniture delivery driver, Otis Perry, was black. Given America in the 1920s, and sadly maybe even today, the race of the witnesses mattered. Here's Ms. Bashan's lawyer, Norman Atkinson, summarizing his discussion of this issue with R.C. Patterson, the lawyer hired by American Indemnity Company to defend Stowers. Mr. Patterson's contention was that the Stowers Furniture Company truck had been disabled a few minutes before the accident by running into a wagon that had been left there, and that the, the, the Negro driver had been to secure assistance by, by telephone, and the truck at the time of the accident had only been there just a few minutes, some 10, 15, or well, possibly 20 minutes. I, I told Mr. Patterson we had two reputable white men who would testify that they had seen the truck there at around, oh, just before 7 o'clock, about, about an hour and a half before the accident. Stowers' personal counsel, John H. Freeman, identified the same issue. The facts, as contended by our Negro driver, and the plaintiff's facts, supported by their two witnesses, we were conscious there was going to be a conflict there. In discussion of the matter, we took into consideration the fact that the plaintiff's witnesses were reputable white men. The case was one in which there probably would be no recovery, or else a recovery very considerably in excess of the $5,000 that had been discussed as the limit of this insurance policy. Depending on how the jury viewed this conflicting testimony, and based further upon how the jury considered the injuries that this young lady had received, Mr. Friedman brought in his law partner, Ben Campbell, to assist the insurance company's retained counsel, R.C. Patterson, in the defense of Stowers at the trial of Ms. Bashan's case. Campbell was no slouch. He had previously served as the mayor of Houston from 1913 to 1917, so he knew the community as well as anybody. He also saw the race issue as a significant problem for the defense. Assuming that the suit was brought by a young lady against the corporation and that the principal defense of the corporation was based on the testimony of a colored boy in their employ, and assuming that the evidence of the colored boy was that it was only 15 minutes from the time of the collision between the truck and the wagon and the accident, and that the testimony of two reputable white men was that they saw the truck in the position where it was at the time of the accident from an hour to an hour and a half before the accident could have occurred. They saw it there at about 7 o'clock at that place, and the accident didn't occur until about 8.20. I would say under those circumstances, there would be a very serious danger of losing the case because it was a Negro in the circumstances detail. Despite these difficult racial challenges, American Indemnity Company felt like it had a solid defense and rejected Ms. Bashan's $5,000 policy limits demand. She must have felt like Stowers had a good defense too, because then she bid against herself and lowered her settlement demand to $4,000. How would American Indemnity Company respond to this new reduced settlement demand? It had a proposal for its insured. Here's the Stowers Houston store manager, I.P. Walker, again. Mr. Patterson came by the store one morning and discussed with me a proposition of settlement, claiming that Atkinson and Atkinson had come to him and offered to settle for $4,000 and asked if we would be willing to put up $1,500 of that amount, stating that the American Indemnity Company was willing to pay $2,500 but would not go any further than that. I discussed it with Mr. Patterson quite a bit, and he impressed on me that this is going to be a pretty serious case. Mr. Patterson apparently had told the same thing to the plaintiff, Ms. Bashan's lawyer, Atkinson. It, it, it is true that the American Identity Company was not willing to pay as much as we had demanded in the settlement, you know, leaving a difference between what it was willing to pay and... and what we were willing to accept. 
Mr. Patterson's attitude was that he was willing to put it up to stowers, and if stowers wanted to pay the balance, they would be able to put the settlement over. Uh, otherwise not. So, would stowers panic and contribute some money towards settlement of the case? Nope. I told Mr. Patterson that I thought we had insured with a pretty good company and that they should take care of us without bringing us into court inasmuch as it could be settled for less than the amount of the policy and that we would not put up any part of it in settlement. Mr. Patterson said if the case was not settled, it would go to trial and they were only liable for $5,000 and that it was so near the amount of their policy they were willing to take a chance on it. I told Mr. Patterson I thought his company should go ahead and settle this claim without bringing us into any kind of litigation, that it was a crime for us to carry insurance and pay for it, and then they would not pay what little claims we might have. He told me he thought that was a fair settlement, a good settlement, and the thing should be settled, but they would not put up over $2,500. Interestingly, Stowers' personal counsel, John H. Freeman, was not quite as gung-ho about rejecting American Indemnity's cost-sharing proposal. To be perfectly frank, Mr. Patterson and I told each other that both of our clients were damn fools, that his insurance company was foolish and not coming up a little above $2,500, and that Stowers was foolish if it could get rid of a lawsuit with the potentialities that this one had by putting up some amount not to do it. Just as a broad proposition, that a suit of this kind had potentialities, and I think our language was that they were damn fools not to do it. Indeed. But, as Miss Bichon's trial against Stowers progressed, it became clear that things were not going well for the defense. American indemnities started to show a change of heart, but the insured was having none of it. The insurance company offered to pay the $5,000 with interest on it up to that time, provided we would give them a release. I refused to give them a release, and they would not pay me. I would not give them a full release of their liability under this policy in connection with this accident, because we were figuring on suing them. Immediately after the case was affirmed, we figured on doing that. And that's exactly what happened. The jury found in favor of Miss Bichon and against Stowers. They awarded her $12,207. When one added up the cost of suit and interest, the judgment came to $14,103.15. That's a little over $217,000 in today's money. Stowers paid the full amount and then sued its insurance company. When the trial arrived in the Stowers extra-contractual lawsuit against its insurance company, the obvious question was why had the carrier not agreed to pay Ms. Bichon's reduced settlement demand of $4,000 before it was too late? The insurance company presented its star witness. My name is W. L. Harton. I am the head of the claims department for American Indemnity Company. I don't like where this is going. Anyway, why didn't the insurer agree to pay the full amount of the demand? It is pretty hard for me to recall the particular instances and the style of a case where the company paid the full limit of their policy without anybody contributing anything because in handling claims for the company for a period of 10 years, I could not recall that. Uh, Don't don't worry. He cleans this testimony up later. I don't know that I can name you a single case where my company paid the full limit of their liability under the policy without trial and without somebody else contributing something to that settlement. I said there was such a case, but I could not give you the name of it. I will state here under my oath that to the best of my recollection, there have been such instances, but I cannot recall a specific case now. Oh boy. I cannot give you the name of any specific case where the company paid more than half. I could not tell you in what town it happened or when it happened. 
I could not tell you the name of the assured, nor the agent who handled it. All I can tell you about that matter is that such a case happened. I don't know the place where it occurred, what court it was in, the name of the fellow that got the money, nor the company to whom the policy was issued in any single instance. Instead of my having a recollection about such an instance, it may be an impression. Okay, who in the world prepped this guy for his trial testimony? Nevertheless, based on this stellar testimony, the trial judge shockingly took the case away from the jury and entered judgment in favor of the insurance company. The matter made its way through the appeal process before eventually landing before the Texas Court of Appeals. The insurance company argued that under the terms of the insurance policy, it had only duties to defend its insured against the lawsuit and to indemnify the insured against any judgment entered against the insured in that suit up to the policy limits. In a 1929 decision that it described as one of first impression in the state, the Texas Court of Appeals disagreed. They said, quote, It is true that the policy is for $5,000, so far as this accident is concerned. But when the liability arose against stowers, the indemnity company was duty-bound to exercise ordinary care to protect the interest of the assured up to the amount of the policy, for the reason that it had contracted to act as his agent and assumed full and absolute control over the litigation arising out of the accident covered by the policy. End quote. The court continued, quote, the provisions of the policy giving the indemnity company absolute and complete control of the litigation as a matter of law carried with it a corresponding duty and obligation on the part of the indemnity company to exercise that degree of care that a person of ordinary care and prudence would exercise under the same or similar circumstances. And a failure to exercise such care and prudence would be negligence on the part of the indemnity company." End quote. The Court of Appeals reversed the trial court's decision and remanded the matter back to the trial court for further proceedings against American Indemnity Company. It specifically noted that the killer testimony from the carrier's head of claims that the company had never offered the full policy limits and prior claims was admissible as to the issue of the carrier's negligence. The holding in this 1929 decision from the Texas Court of Appeals would become known as the Stowers Doctrine. Over time, the person of ordinary care standard would become an ordinarily prudent insurer standard, but essentially, the Stowers Doctrine remains alive in Texas to this day. Stowers was actually not the first appellate decision in the United States to hold an insurance company liable for extra contractual damages when it failed to settle a liability claim, but it quickly became one of the most famous and widely cited. While most states today require more than a showing of mere negligence on the part of the insurance company, such as bad faith or dishonesty, nearly every state now imposes some type of extra contractual liability on carriers in this situation. It has changed the way that liability carriers evaluate claims. Once upon a time, one could have argued, as the carrier and stowers did, that liability policies require the insurer to only defend the insured against lawsuits and indemnify the insured against judgments entered in those lawsuits. Up to the policy limit. It would not have been a crazy position. We judged the testimony from the insurer's head of claims and stowers harshly, Actually, we're horrified by it because we know what bad faith means today. But in Texas in the 1920s, that law did not exist, and it did not exist in most states. After all, despite that cringeworthy testimony, the trial judge actually took the case away from the jury and entered judgment in favor of the carrier. And remember the comments from Stowers' personal counsel? To be perfectly frank, Mr. Patterson and I told each other that both of our clients were damn fools. That's a recognition that the settlement posture of the liability carrier was no more or less risky than the decision of the insured not to contribute anything towards settlement. But a decision like Stowers shows us 
that when liability carriers do not settle cases that they should, they may have something more to lose than merely paying the policy limits. If the insurance company chooses wrongly, and that decision was made negligently or in bad faith, or whatever the particular state standard is, the insurance company may have to pay the entirety of an excess judgment, or in some jurisdictions, even more. That reality means that insurance companies cannot play the role of riverboat gambler, if you will, in these liability cases. Instead, they have to become shrewd and wise evaluators of risk, which, when you think about it, is what insurance is all about anyway. I will say, in my over 20 years of practice and representing insurance companies, I have never seen a carrier act anything like the insurer did in stores. The policyholder bar will argue that that shows the tort system works well when it comes to bad faith. And in theory, they may not be entirely wrong. An insurer should not refuse to pay claims when it knows that liability and damages are clear in order to try to shake down its insurer to contribute to a settlement. In my view, though, the pendulum in bad faith has swung too far the other way in favor of plaintiffs and insureds. But that is another podcast episode for another day. In the meantime, we have Mimi Bashan and this wonderful cast of characters from Stowers to thank for this landmark decision. It's just another tale from Insurance Land. want to thank you for listening to this first episode of Tales from Insurance Land. We had some really amazing voice actors contribute to this episode. Lauren Breeden played the role of Mimi Bashan. She sounded pretty injured to me. Johnny Unitas played the part of Otis Perry. Ken Hurst played the part of I.P. Walker. Colin Hughes pulled double duty and played both the parts of Norman Atkinson and Ben Campbell. J.C. Martin played the part of John H. Freeman. He nailed the damn fools, in my opinion, pretty well. And of course, Neil Williams played the part of W.O. Harding, the best head of claims ever. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Texas attorneys Vince Morgan and Michael Sean Quinn. Almost 20 years ago, they published an article in the Journal of Texas Insurance Law titled, Damn Fools, Looking Back at Stowers After 75 Years. It's a great article that is well worth your time in reading. Among other things, They pulled the original trial transcripts from the Stowers case and found the great quotes our voice actors read for you in this podcast episode. At the outset of their article, Vince and Michael wrote, It is our hope that by engaging in this retrospective look at the case, some new insights can be gained into the legal doctrine, and that interested readers can get a brief look at the colorful history of this case, not to mention the state of Texas, along the way. I know that I did. And I hope that this podcast episode adds just a little bit to that discussion. By the way, you can get links to all of these people and publications in this podcast episode's show notes. Thank you again for listening. And until next time. I could not tell you in what town it happened or when it happened. I could not tell you the name of the assured nor the agent who handled it. I don't know the place where it occurred. What court it was in, the name of the fellow that got the money.